Well, we're in the home stretch now. This is the last chapter we'll be covering, the first lecture of a two-lecture series for Chapter 20. We'll be covering pages 689 to 717 today. And the title of this chapter is Cellular Communities, Tissues, Stem Cells, and Cancer, but we'll leave cancer for the next lecture. So today we're going to talk about first the extracellular matrix. We've actually been referring to the ECM quite a bit lately as we've continued on in our discussion of cell biology, but today we'll formally define it and tell you what it is, what it's made of, what it's for. From there we'll move on to collagen, the main component of the ECM. We'll talk about polysaccharide gels and how uh, cells make a compression system, a, a, a protection against compression using polysaccharides in the extracellular matrix and water as well, creating a gel with these two structures. We'll move on to how cells of the epithelium are connected with each other, how we make sheets of cells, and more importantly, how cells have junctions with one another, the different kinds of junctions and what the function and responsibilities of these junctions are. And then we'll move on very briefly and talk about how tissues are organized and introduce you to the idea of stem cells. Here we'll talk about stem cells for tissue regeneration and tissue repair. We won't go into any real depth for stem cells, but it's important to know what stem cells are and how stem cells behave as we get ready to move on to the cancer portion of this chapter. So the second half of this entire semester, the half of the semester that we've been dedicating to cell biology, has been spent discussing cellular phenomena that occur in single cells. But when we started this semester a long, long time ago, I promised you that this course would be a course where we focused largely on ourselves and we learned how we worked as living organisms. And we are most definitely not single cells. So we had to cover single cells, of course. Single cells are the basic building block, the basic unit of life. And we couldn't understand what larger uh, multicellular organisms did without understanding single cells first. But it is time to move on to a multicellular discussion. We are multicellular organisms. We are made up of a huge community of a trillion cells belonging to different cell types, all working together in a very coordinated fashion for a single purpose, to keep us alive. So this is a very, very crude example of what I'm getting at here, a very small cross-section of a particular structure. But you can see very uh, superficially here, just by looking at this, uh, many different cell types with different shapes, different staining patterns, uh, different placement, each of these cells contributing to a larger whole. So we'll talk about that today, uh, individual cells coming together for a single purpose in a coordinated way. Of course, this adds an entirely new level of complexity to everything we've been talking about. Single cells are complex enough, but once you start to combine single cells into larger ordered structures, larger systems of communication, the complexity just goes up from there. There is, of course, I'm sure you know, a hierarchical organization to all multicellular organisms. We are no exception to this. We have individual similar cells with a similar shape and a similar function that come together as an organized cooperative structure that we call a tissue, a tissue type. Similar coordinated tissue types are organized into larger multi-tissue structures that have a similar or common goal, and we call these structures organs. Oops, excuse me. Multiple organs that do similar and related functions come together and are arranged into multi-organ systems. And of course, if you get enough multi-organ systems together, all working together to support life, you have yourself a single organism. And that's what we are. We are each a single organism made up of multiple organ systems, each of which containing multiple organs, each organ containing multiple tissues of different cell types, and each of those tissues made up of individual cells. In this course, we cover, of course, those individual cells, and today we begin the discussion on the tissues that they come together to create. If you are interested in any order of structure above the tissue level, then you should, if you haven't already, take anatomy and physiology. That's all anatomy and physiology is about. Start at the tissue level and go all the way up to the organismal level. We don't do that in this course. So tough noogies. So we have different tissues. These are tissues composed of related cells. They don't have to be identical cells, but cells of related function. So we have nervous tissues, of course, muscle tissues. We have epithelial tissues, which we'll talk about in detail today. Connective tissues, which we'll also cover in detail today. And so 
epithelial tissues, connective tissues, muscle tissues, ner nervous tissues. These are cells brought together to make larger multicellular structures that have a common purpose and have a similar function, but by no means do all the cells of these different tissues have to be identical. What they do all have in common, however, is that all of these tissues are also made up of what is called an extracellular matrix or an ECM. This ECM is not cellular. It's simply proteins and other macromolecules. But what the ECM does is it supports the cells of these tissues. It binds them together. It gives them tensile strength, support from stress, etc. You can think of the ECM as a kind of cytoskeleton but it's a cytoskeleton that's found outside the cell instead of inside. Just as the cytoskeleton was a network of proteins that came together really to give durability and tensile strength largely, the ECM is the same, a conglomeration of proteins that come together to give support and strength, except the ECM lies outside the cell. Cells can interact with each other physically be connected to one another, chemically get molecules to one another all through the ECM. The components of the ECM do come from cells. The proteins that make up the ECM are secreted proteins, secreted by specific cells. It's important to note that there are other ways cells can also come together and interact physically uh, that are independent of the ECM. Cell junctions are an example of this. Cell junctions are structures which link cells together through direct physical contacts, and we'll talk about cell junctions near the end of the lecture. Some of these junctions allow cells to communicate with one another, have those private whispered conversations that we referred to in our cellular communication lecture. We're going to be coming full circle on a lot of different topics today, bringing up things that we have covered before, but were unable to cover fully, and now we can kind of close some loops. So um, these cellular junctions also allow cells to share mechanical stresses, uh, allow mechanical stress to be distributed among multiple cytoskeletons. We've talked about that before. We'll talk about it again. But it's the ECM that really is pervasive throughout all multicellular tissue types. You see, these cell junctions that I'm referring to, they're pretty specific to epithelial cells. All cells have ECMs as an important integral part of their um, structure and their uh, strength. And so let's talk about ECMs first because it pertains to all tissue types and it's actually the more important of the two. So the extracellular matrix. Most animals need to be quick, strong, and robust. By robust we mean not easily broken, uh, able to withstand some type of trauma, some type of stress. So. Of course, for different reasons, animals require this. A, a lion needs to be quick, strong, and robust so that it can catch its prey and survive by eating. Uh, deer or uh, antelope, whatever it is lions eat, need to be quick, strong, and robust for completely opposite reasons, so that they are not eaten, so that they can survive to another day. But all animals need to be fast, strong, and durable. Plants need to be strong and robust, too. Uh, strong growing up strong, uh, with, able to withstand wind, able to withstand storm, and robust, able to withstand the stresses of a drought or the stresses of too much water. But plants don't really need to be quick, do they? I mean, the plant's life cycle is a static one. They're rooted to the ground and they don't go anywhere. So plants actually got off easy on this deal. Plants get their strength and their durability from cell walls. That's what allows cells to, I'm sorry, plants to grow straight up towards the sun. It's a, what allows plants to withstand the high forces of the wind. The durability of plants come from their cellulose cell wall. And you just look at a microscopic picture of a plant cell and you see how sturdy and regular and rectangular they look. That's all due to the cell wall that surrounds a plant cell. So cell walls make you stiff and static, durable and strong, but they certainly don't make you quick. Uh, they make you quite the opposite, pretty much rooted to one spot. So animals couldn't get by with cell walls. Animals needed a way to be strong and durable also, but also flexible. Animals needed that quickness, that flexibility, that ease and range of motion. And so animal cells look quite different from plant cells. They're more rounded, and they're less regular, and they just look as though they are more flexible. So how did we evolve around this? How do you glue animal cells together in a way that gives you toughness and resilience and strength and durability, 
but also allow for the flexibility and dynamicness for quick, sudden movements. The way around this evolutionarily was the evolve. Uh, the evolution of uh, extracellular matrix, and to be more specific, a variety of different related types of ECMs. Bones and tendons are largely made from ECMs, but they are made from ECMs that are hard, much more static and less dynamic, and very, very durable, because that's what bones and tendons need to be. These ECMs are very rich in structural fibrous proteins. They're very mechanical, not really prone to flexibility, and they shouldn't be. But muscles and skin, these are the tissue types that need to be more flexible, less static, less hard, less dense. And so the ECMs in these cells are, in these tissue types, are looser, less dense, more scanty, less protein rich. You still need mechanical strength in these cells, but the mechanical strength in these cells comes from the internal cytoskeletons, the idea of shared load. It's the intermediate filaments in muscle and skin cells that give them tensile strength. And so different ECMs for different purposes, for different cell roles. All animal tissues, though, regardless of their type, uh, consist largely of ECM. ECM is the primary component of connective tissues in animal tissue layers. So plants have this one-size-fits-all strategy, right? They need durability and toughness in all of their cells, but they don't really need any different type of durability or toughness. And so a single type of cell wall around every single plant cell works for plants. We can't do that. We have to avoid that type of strategy because we have different connective tissue types that need different types of durability. Bone and tendon that needs tough dense, static durability, and then skin and muscle that needs more of a stretchy tensile strength durability. So we have different ECMs for different reasons to tailor these cell types uh, for the types of stresses that they will be uh, undergoing. For the convenience of classification, we categorize animal tissues into one of four very general categories. We have our connective tissues. Connective tissues bear much of the mechanical load that we experience as an organism, and so the ECMs in connective tissues are extremely plentiful and, and protein-rich. They're quite durable. We have epithelial tissues. Here we need more of a stretchiness rather than a dense durability, and so the ECMs in epithelial cells is very, very minimal. What keeps cells together and strong in epithelial tissues are direct cell-cell contacts between those cells, those junctions that I mentioned. Here, the mechanical loads on these cells, the stresses that these cells experience, is absorbed and distributed across the cell's cytoskeletons, uh, sharing that load. And, and we talked about that in our cytoskeleton lecture, and I even showed this figure there as well, this idea of the intermediate filaments kind of sharing the burden of a mechanical stress keeping all of the cells together. Our third class of tissues in our, in our bodies is nervous tissue, cells of the nervous system. That's not just neurons, there are other nervous cell types such as glial cells, support cells in the nervous system, but we're not going to go down any of that road in this class. This isn't a neuronal class. And then the fourth type are muscular cells, muscular tissues, and we talked about those enough already. We talked about muscle contraction and sarcomeres, myofibrils, and all of that, so we'll leave muscle cells out of this lecture as well today. So let's talk about connective tissues first. Even within this single category of con connective tissues, we have a huge variety of cell types and a huge variety of functions. The properties of these different cell types directly re reflect their, their roles in the body and their responsibilities to the organisms that they are part of. Connective tissues can be very, very tough and flexible, such as skin and tendon. It can be very, very hard and dense, as in bone. They can be neither hard, dense, nor tough, but instead soft and resilient, shock-absorbing, like cartilage. And so much so that connective tissue can even be very, very loose, fluid-like, and, and viscous. Believe it or not, the vitreous humor of the eye, the fluid in the eyeball, is connective tissue. It's actually a, a very unique form of connective tissue, but it's connective tissue. So all of these tissue types, each of these structures that we just referred to, the primary component of them is not cells. The primary component of them is ECM. They are more ECM than they are anything else. 
There are cells in each of these tissue types whose sole responsibility it is to produce the proteins of the ECM. And then also there are cells in these tissue types that give the function to the tissue type. So what I mean by that is uh, in, in cartilage, there is, uh, or excuse me, in, in muscle cells, there are muscle cells themselves, the, the muscle fibers that we discussed previously. Those are the cells that give the function to the muscle tissue. But also scattered throughout muscle cells are specialized cells whose job it is to produce the ECM of muscle tissue. And so you always have this mix of ECM producing cells that provide the extracellular matrix for that particular tissue type and what we call the primary cells or the functional cells of those tissue types that actually give those tissues their main function. So the cells that produce the ECM are scattered throughout these tissue types, scattered throughout the ECM, and the textbook says scattered like raisins in a pudding. I'm not really sure what that means, but I thought it was an interesting way to describe it. Here what we're looking at is um, epithelial tissue, I believe, but you're seeing mostly ECM. Everything that looks pretty faint is ECM. Those dark... Um, ovals, those dark spots that you see, those are the cells of this tissue. Most of the, those are ECM secreting cells, but as you look at this figure, you see that the, the cells don't really make up the majority of what you see. The majority of what you see is ECM. So what is ECM? What is the extracellular matrix? Let's give it some true tangible definition now. The main structural tensile strength load-bearing component of the extracellular matrix is a protein, a fibrous protein called collagen. Different connective tissues associated with different tissue types have different properties because primarily they're made up of different types of collagen, they have different amounts of collagen protein in them, and or there are other ECM components in addition to collagen present in that ECM. Elastin is a great example of this, which what gives our skin its stretchiness is elastin protein that is specifically in the ECM of skin. But it is collagen that provides the main tensile strength in all animal connective tissue. Collagen is found in all multicellular animals on this planet. We mammals have about 20 different types of independent collagen genes, giving rise to a little bit over 20 different types of independent collagen proteins. Collagen is the main component of bone. It's the main component of skin. It's the main component of tendon. About 25% of protein in any mammal is collagen alone. That's incredible. What I mean by that, if I were to take you completely lice you, break you down to nothing but the proteins that make you what you are, and weigh those proteins, 25% of that weight would just be collagen. And the other 75% would be all of the other proteins needed to make you you. It's amazing. Collagen is by far, hands down, bar none, no close second, the most plentiful protein in us. So what is collagen? How is it made? What, what structure does it take? Collagen is a protein fiber, as I already said, and it usually comes in a trimer, meaning it's made up of three subunits. These three collagen subunits are wound around each other. They're kind of braided around each other as a triple helix. And then these trimers are further assembled into fibrils. So this is a kind of a familiar structure. We've seen structure like this before. We have a single collagen protein chain. Three collagen protein chains come together as a trimer. This is a single collagen complex. Many, many of these collagen molecules then come together to form a larger collagen fibril. It might be hard to see, but each of these black dots in this fibril is supposed to be a single collagen strand. And then many, many fibrils come together to make a collagen fiber. So each of these black dots is a single collagen fibril. Each fibril is quite thin but they can grow to be quite long, and as I just said, fibrils are packed together to create much thicker collagen cables or collagen fibers. All connective tissues have collagen-secreting cells, but they are specialized to different tissue types. Different tissue types have different types of collagen, and so they have different cells to secrete those collagen types. But collagen is the primary component of the ECM. What these collagen secreting cells are called, their names are different, specific to their different tissue types. We'll talk about fibroblasts most commonly. Fibroblasts, fibroblasts are collagen secreting cells that you find 
secreting the ECMs of skin, tendon, and many other connective tissues throughout our body. In bone, we have a different collagen secreting cell type called osteoblasts. Osteoblasts make the ECM of bone, and obviously the ECM of bone is quite different than that of skin and tendons. Collagen, regardless of which tissue type it's being used for, is made intracellularly. It's a protein, so of course the only place it can be made is inside a cell. And then that cell that made the collagen secretes it. Secretes it using the, say it with me now, exocytotic pathway. Right? We made this thing in the ER. We threaded it into the ER, the rough ER. It was folded, then went to a transport vesicle. It was transported to the Golgi, and the Golgi it was heavily modified. It went through the Golgi through a series of vesicles. After the vesicles left the Golgi, they went straight to the cell membrane. Rab proteins, tethering proteins, snare proteins. We had vesicle fusion, and out of the cell poured collagen. Remember, everything's connected. Everything we talked about in this course is part of one big story. It's also important to note that Although there are many cells that make collagen and make an ECM, it's important for some other cells to destroy the ECM, intentionally, on purpose. Some cells have to have the ability to degrade and cut through the ECM. The extracellular matrix in general, and collagen proteins in particular, often create a pretty durable barrier within tissues. In fact, this is the main job of the ECM, to provide a protective structural component, a protective structural barrier for tissues. What you're looking at here is a collagen ECM. Those They look like webs, almost like cobwebs. Those are individual collagen fibers, collagen cables. And then a little bit less bright, these kind of mushy structures that you see here in gray, those are cells. Those are individual cells within the ECM. So can you imagine being a cell that needs to get through this to do your job? It's pretty intimidating, right? It looks pretty difficult. So you need to have some enzymes that literally cut through these fibers, like a machete cutting through a dense forest. You need to be able to cut through this ECM and burrow, literally burrow your way through this barrier. Whenever tissues grow, cells need to move in the ECM, and so they got to be able to get through this meshwork. Whenever a tissue gets damaged and requires repair, that includes infection. So even cells mediating an immune response need to get through the collagen of the ECM. These cells require enzymes to do that. They're called matrix proteases. Matrix proteases specifically cut the proteins of the ECM clearing a path through the ECM, allowing these cells to get to where they need to go. However, matrix proteases also play a large role in arthritis. What's arthritis? Arthritis is the breakdown of cartilage, the breakdown of the lubrication and the padding between the bones of the joints. That lubrication and padding is all connective tissue. It's all ECM. So if cells go a little crazy, make too much matrix protease, break down too much of the ECM, cartilage can be destroyed, lubrication between the joints can be destroyed, and crippling arthritis can result. In addition, malignant cells that have gone metastatic and are traveling from one place to another, they burrow through the ECM to get to their target destinations. Those cells also require matrix proteases, and so matrix proteases play a large role in metastasis, as we'll talk a little bit about in our next lecture. So there are three things, actually, that cancerous cells need to do. It's divide like crazy. Of course, that's the tumor. Get blood supply to that growing tumor. That's angiogenesis. And then if metastasis does develop, leave the primary tumor, burrow into the bloodstream, and make it to some target organ. Uh, and that all requires matrix proteases. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. We'll talk about cancer in the next lecture. So it's not enough to just spill collagen out of the cell. It's not enough to just do exocytosis and keep dumping collagen out into the extracellular environment. That's not what an ECM is. Cells also have to organize the collagen that they secrete. And so to do that, you have to pull the collagen into whatever it is you're making, into fibers like rope to give it that tensile strength, much like intermediate filaments, the collagen organized into these long rope-like fibers is what gives collagen the tensile strength, what gives the ECM the tensile strength. So that's one form that collagen needs to take. 
In skin, collagen isn't so much rope-like, but much more wicker basket-like. It's woven into a crisscross lattice work of protein to give more of a, uh, a tensile strength. I, I already said that, but a, a strength and a durability for flexing. Think about why collagen would take this wicker basket weaving shape in skin, and think about why that might make sense. We'll come back to that another time. In thicker tissues, which are prone to distortion, prone to mechanical stresses on all sides, collagen fibers are arranged in layers of alternating direction. They are layered here side to side and then front to back. So these are going left to right and these are coming out at you. Next layer left to right, next layer coming out at you. Next layer left to right, next layer coming out at you. So that's how you get durability from uh, distortion, from pressure from a given direction. Well, believe it or not, we do this. I, I mean, human beings do this when they're building things. This is the same exact principle applied to construction. The bricks going left to right, the bricks going front to back, the bricks going left to right, the bricks going front and back. Bricklayers lay bricks in this way because when you alternate brick direction, you give greater strength and durability to forces on the wall. And collagen is arranged this way to give greater durability and strength against forces against the tissue. Amazing. Tissue is prone to stretching. Stretching, not distortion, but stretching, pulling, like muscle. Collagen fibers are organized into parallel bundles, into these large cables of collagen. We do that? This, believe it or not, is a bridge cable. Uh, a sample of a bridge cable that supports the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And it's hard to see in this figure, so I blew it up for you. Uh, this is what we're actually looking at in this cable. So it's this region blown up right here. Look what this cable is made of. Probably millions of small wires, thick gauge wires. All these wires bundled together into a huge diameter cable. That's what a collagen cable is. Individual collagen fibers bundled together into a much larger diameter um, cable of collagen. Why? Because this is the best structure to give you resistance against stretching. That's the biggest risk of a railroad of, of a bridge cable is that it's going to stretch to the point of breaking and no longer support that roadway. And so this is the best way to avoid those types of strains. Amazing. So what this means is that again, it's not enough to just dump collagen out. Once that collagen has been secreted, it must be arranged into the appropriate structure, woven into a whisker, wicker basket, uh, laid like bricks with alternating directions, or bundled together into cables. Believe it or not, I don't even believe it, but fibroblasts do this arranging. Fibroblasts crawl on collagen. Fibroblasts, these are individual cells, pull on that collagen, stretch it, compact it, weave it, bundle it, alternate it into the sheets, the baskets, the latticework, the cables that it needs to be for a particular structure. Single cell fibroblasts do this. Amazing. In fact, they're so pre-programmed to do it that you can get them to do it outside of the body. What you see here in this diagram are two fibroblast cells here on either side of the field of view. And they're growing on a media, they're growing on a plate that is loaded with collagen, loose, random collagen fibers. And if you look closely, you can kind of see what looks like a linear wave, almost like a band that's connecting these two cells. These are collagen proteins that these two cells have arranged into a linear pattern. Uh, they're starting to arrange it into a collagen cable. And so the reason why this looks as though it's going left to right here is because all of the individual microscopic collagen fibers have been arranged in a similar orientation. They've been arranged to go left from right, and you see that reflected in the structure of the media, the structure of the plate. These fibroblasts rearrange this collagen between them to make it all linear, all oriented. Blows my mind. So now we know what the ECM is. We know what it's for. It's a external, extracellular, structural framework that provides tensile strength to tissues and cells. 
And now we know what it's made of. It's collagen bundles and takes different forms depending on what the tissue type needs to be durable against, but we know now what it's made of. So we're going to come full circle once, uh, for the first time of many in this lecture, and we're going to come back to integrins. We've already discussed integrins at some length. They are these transmembrane proteins that serve to bridge actin filaments inside the cell with the surface on which the cell is crawling. We never really defined that surface, did we? We never really said what it is that these integrins were binding to outside the cell, what it is that a cell crawls on. Well, we will now. The cells are crawling on the ECM. That's what they're crawling on. And the proteins that they have to contend with are these collagen proteins, which the ECM is made of. So we have actin filaments inside the cell. We have integrins leading outside the cell, and now we have an ECM that we need to crawl on. Surprisingly, however, integrins cannot bind directly to collagen. So we need another adapter protein called fibronectin. Fibronectin is a protein that is linked to collagen fibers, and integrin can bind to fibronectin. So we have this situation where actin is bound to integrin, integrin is bound directly to fibronectin, and fibronectin is linked to collagen, and collagen is the primary component of the ECM. So cells crawl on the ECM by linking their intracellular cytoskeleton of actin to integrin transmembrane proteins. The integrins interact with the fibronectin, and the fibronectin is linked to collagen. That is your connection. A little bit more specifically from your textbook, we have the actin fibers inside the cell as part of the cytoskeleton, linked to, through some adapters, integrin, Integrin spans the membrane leading outside the cell. Integrin interacts with fibronectin. Fibronectin interacts with collagen, and that is your ECM. But cells need to crawl. So these integrins can bind to fibronectin, but they also need to let go of fibronectin. Every time the cell needs to crawl a step forward, we need to cycle through a series of binding, pulling, and letting go. We talked about that uh, when we talked about myosin and all the cellular movements that occur. That happens through a series of shape changes or conformational changes in the integrin proteins. Integrin proteins change their shape, and by changing their shape, they change their function. There's one conformation of the integrin proteins that cannot bind to fibronectin. It's all folded up, all bundled up. This is what it looks like in an electron microscope. And then the active form of integrin is extended and can interact with fibronectin, can grab onto the ECM. So to let go, we go into this conformation, and to grab on, we go to this conformation. These integrin changes can be affected by intracellular molecular signals causing cells to let go or grab, and those can promote cell crawling or block it, depending on which conformation of integrin you get. But it also works the other way. What the integrin did outside the cell, did it grab on or did it let go, can cause signals to be transmitted inside the cell. So signals from inside the cell affect integrin crawling, and integrin crawling can affect signals going into the cell. So all of that is the tensile component of the ECM, the durability and strength that the ECM can give. Now we're going to talk about how the ECM allows certain tissue types to resist compression forces. Not tensile stretching forces, but forces of compression. It's a completely different strategy. So collagen, as we just described, is a cable. It's a thick cable. It's a hard cable, it's a dense cable, it's a durable cable. It's wonderful at tensile strength. It's ideal for resisting stretching forces. But it's awful at resisting compression, and it is not good at filling the empty space between cells. Think of it this way. If you get, onto, if you get into a head-on collision, God forbid, but if you were to get into a head-on collision in your car, would you prefer something that gave great tensile strength and resisted stretching, such as this? Or would you prefer to be um, helped and supported by a structure that was very good at resisting compression and very good at filling empty space, such as this? This is your head hitting a collagen cable, and this is your head hitting the ECM components we're going to talk about next. These are ideal for resisting compression. These are ideal for resisting stretching. Two completely different forces, two completely different ways at being resilient against them. So we need a completely different set of molecules to serve the resistance to compression function of the ECM. And those molecules are proteoglycans. 
Proteoglycans are found in the ECM and they withstand pressure forces. Proteoglycans are very small proteins linked to very large, usually negatively charged, sugars. We'll refer to them as GAGs. Glycoacyl, blah, 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 blah. So we'll refer to them as GAGs. This is the sugar component of a proteoglycan. This is the GAG component of a proteoglycan. And then there would be a, a little chain of amino acids coming off of this structure at some point as well. I'll refer to these structures as GAGs from now on because it really is the sugar part of these molecules that is the business end, that the, provides the resistance to compression. But keep in mind that when I say GAGs, uh, I really should be saying proteoglycans because there is a small protein component to these as well. So in ECMs of our denser tissue types, in the ECMs of bone, you really don't find proteoglycans at all. You don't find these gags at all in bone. In tendon, you find very, very few of them. They're very much in the minority in these denser tensile strength ECMs. Collagen is the main component in these tissue types. But in the softer ECMs, we find lots and lots of proteoglycans with lots and lots of gags. And this is because the negative sugars that I mentioned are very hydrophilic. And so they attract a lot of water to them. And so these gags, these proteoglycans, they bind water. And that's the compression resistance. Just as the airbag itself is not what saves your life in that head-on collision, the airbag is very good at holding air. And the air provides the compression resistance. These proteoglycans are very, very good at holding water, but the water is what's providing the compression resistance. The water is the air in the airbag. The vitreous humor of the eye, we talked about that before. It's largely connective tissue. It's largely ECM. Well, it's largely gags and water. Really, the vitreous humor is so fluid and so loose because it's almost no collagen at all and primarily made up of these water-holding gag chain. So, to say it simply, proteoglycans and gags in, specific, in particular form gels. They swell with water. And this is how they cushion things. Now let's bring it both together. We've got a particular and unique situations in certain places of the body. The knee is a perfect example. The ECM in the knee, the cartilage of the knee, the connective tissues of the knee, they have to be tough, durable, and resistant, resilient because the knee can be stretched quite a bit and it needs to be very resistant to this stretching force. But the knee also needs to be cushioned and compression resistant because as you jump and land, as you kick, even as you walk or run, there are horrible, horrible compression forces being put on your knee. So what is the knee to do? Well, the knee contains a lot of collagen but this collagen is woven into that wicker basket type lattice work. And in the gaps, the diamonds of that wicker basket, in the diamonds of that lattice, is nothing but proteoglycans holding a lot of water. A beautiful way to merge these two systems, no? Where you have a lot of cushion, a lot of water holding, a lot of compression resistance, surrounded by a very tough and durable stretch resistant framework. The knee joint can withstand great stressing forces as well as withstand pressures, pressures that exceed hundreds of kilograms of force per centimeter. That's a lot of pressure. Just amazing. Okay, so let's step away from ECMs now. In the first couple slides, I told you that we need to hold a multicellular organism together. That's really what we're trying to do in this lecture. We have individual cells that can carry out coordinated function, but if we have any hope at all of hope having a multicellular organism, these individual cells, they need to be held into a greater whole, a multi multicellular organism. The ECM is one strategy for holding cells together. The ECM is the adhering mechanism. Cells are in the ECM. That holds cells together into a larger structure. Epithelial sheets is the other strategy. Epithelial sheets is how cells literally hold on to one another, almost independent of an ECM, in order to become multicellular tissues. Most of the 200 different cell types that we find in our body, and that's roughly the number of different cell types we have, are organized into clusters of cells, or more accurately, sheets, that we call epithelia. 
epithelia plural, epithelium is singular. These sheets of cells can be many sheets thick. So you have a thick tissue, and we would call that tissue stratified. Skin is a stratified epithelial structure. It's made up of many, many different layers of single cells. But the fundamental structure of any tissue in an epithelial system is a single sheet of cells. That single sheet can be folded in on itself, making a multicellular, multi-layered system that's stratified. Or, like the lining of the gut, it can truly be a single cell thick. But single cells, single layers of cells making a single sheet is the primary unit of structure for epithelium. That means if we're going to make a sheet of cells, we need a way for cells to attach to one another side by side. That's how you're going to make a sheet. Epithelial cells come in many different morphologies. We call them the stratified. Here you can see they're layers of cells sitting one on top of the other. So we've already defined that. The simple epithelial morphology is just a single row of cells, a single layer of cells kind of standing on its head here. We have columnar, which is more like columns. They're a little bit longer and thinner. Cuboidal, because they look more squarish, more like cubes. And squamous cells are very, very flat, and they kind of spread out, take a very thin profile, but they spread out over a large area. Any particular tissue can be all of one type. So some tissue is all simple, and other tissues are mixed. And you'll see different epithelial cells of different morphologies in a single tissue. That's all fine. Some tissues serve a single purpose. Skin is a good example. The purpose of skin is to be a protective barrier around our body. That's a single purpose. But other tissues are extremely diverse in what they do, and they serve multiple functions, multiple responsibilities at any given time. Some epithelial tissues secrete things. So endocrine tissue is uh, hormone-secreting tissues. Those are epithelial cells. Um, tears are secreted by epithelial cells in the tear duct. Sweat of course, comes from sweat glands, sweat cells in our skin. And milk, being nothing more than modified sweat, uh, uh, nutrition-rich sweat, is also made by epithelial cells. So never should you think of epithelial cells as skin cells. Skin cells are epithelial cells, but so are so many other cell types in our body. Some epithelial cells absorb things. The lining of our gut is epithelial cells. And some epithelial cells secrete things, as we already said, hormones and tears and such. Even the first line of sensory cells are, believe it or not, epithelial and not neuronal. The cells in your eye, the retinal cells that sense light, those are epithelial cells, not neuronal cells. The cells in your ear that have auditory hairs on them to pick up the vibrations of sound, those are epithelial cells. And so epithelial cells are really our most important, most diverse group of cells. And as diverse as they are, as different as they are, epithelial cells do share many characteristics in common. They are, first and foremost, the only cell type that lines the outside of our body. So any cell type that you find that faces the outside world, that's and epithelial cells. That's not just skin. So think of the inside of your nose, deep into your ear canal. That includes the lining of your mouth, all epithelial cells. Interestingly, epithelial cells are the only cell type that lines the inside of your body, too. So any cell that faces the interior body cavity is an epithelial cell. If you think about it, it makes complete sense. What makes epithelial cells unique is that they can join together side by side and form sheets. So evolutionarily speaking, epithelial cells had to be the cell type responsible for lining our inside and outside. In fact, no other cell could do it. To line the inside and outside of our bodies, we needed sheets of cells. And the only cell types that form sheets are epithelial cells. Epithelial cells are our barrier cells in every single respect. So in a very real way, the epithelial cells for us as an organism are what the cell membrane is for a single cell. And you can take this analogy all the way out and it continues to work. Epithelial cells keep some things inside that should be in and keep other things out that should be out. Cell membranes do that as well. Epithelial cells import good things into us. When you eat, the nutrition that you get in your gut, that's absorbed through epithelial cells in your gut lining. That's good. 
We need that. And the epithelial cells is how we secrete all the bad stuff out of our body. Cell membranes do the same. Like I said, the analogy holds up no matter how far you take it. Our sensory cells, I just told you, are epithelial cells. And you can think of those epithelial cells like the cellular receptors on a cell membrane. Cellular receptors on a cell membrane hear the information coming to the cell from the exterior environment, from the outside world. And that's exactly what our sensory cells do. Hear and receive outside information and pass it inwards. It's crazy. It's freaky in a way how the gross, large organization of us as an organism recapitulates and mirrors the individual, unique organization of a single cell. Maybe there's something there. In any event, epithelial cells are polarized. They have two different sides. Epithelial cells rest on what we call the basal lamina. The two sides of an epithelial cell, or the two sides of an epithelial sheet of cells, is called the apical and basal surface. The apical surface is what faces outward. Now, don't get confused by that. By outward, we mean away from the tissue, away from the body proper. So the apical surface of the epithelial cells on your skin are facing out into the air, out into the world. That makes sense. But in the gut, in the lining of the inside of our body, the apical surface points inward, because inward is away from the body proper. Right? So it's the apical surface that always makes contact with non-organismal stuff, whether that be air or gut. The apical surface is what points away from the body proper, from the tissue proper. That means the basal surface is the surface that does face the tissue, does face the body, and it's the basal surface, in fact, that uh, anchors the epithelial cell to the organism. So the basal surface of an epithelial cell adheres to the organism itself, and it does so by connecting to this basal lamina. The basal lamina is a very thin but very, very tough sheet of extracellular matrix. It's made up of a specific type of collagen called collagen 4. Collagen 4 creates this thin extracellular matrix. There's also another protein called laminin in the basal lamina. That's where it gets its name. Laminin is a protein that can be bound by integrins. So we're back to integrins again. Just like integrins can bind to fibronectin, integrins can also bind to laminin. That's on the exterior side of the cell. So inside we still have actin. The integrin is still anchored to actin, but now that integrin is also interacting with laminin in the basal lamina. And so this is anchoring that epithelial cell in place. And back up for just a second. So we're down here. We're talking about the basal surface of the cell and this basal membrane. We're going to have integrin proteins transmembrane integrin proteins. They're adhered to actin filaments inside this epithelial cell. And then outside the cell, those integrin proteins are binding to laminin molecules that are in this basal lamina, anchoring the entire cell to this yellow connective tissue, this yellow ECM. And so suffice it to say, I don't think I need to say it, but epithelial cells are polarized. They have two different ends. The apical and the basal sides are different, and they have different functions. The apical and basal sides are different biochemically. They are different structurally. They have different functions and different roles. These epithelial cells could not function otherwise. Epithelial cells, by definition, by their very role, must have a top and a bottom because the two sides of the cell do such different things. The basal side adheres. The apical side interacts with the world. More specifically, if we're talking about the lining of the gut, the basal cell is what connects the cell to the actual gut tissue. That's one function that needs to be on the back end of the cell. That's where the anchoring needs to occur. The apical surface of that gut lining cell has to be able to absorb nutrients. That's the job of the apical end. It faces into the gut, and it has to be able to get those nutrients out of the blood. I mean, out of the, uh, out of the gut and, and transmit them to the blood at the basal side. 
So hopefully now you're pretty comfortable with the layout, the structure of a single epithelial cell sheet, the single epithelial cell. You know that it's polarized. You know that it's got an anchoring side at the basal side. You know how it's anchored. You know there's an apical end. I always think of that as the business end of the cell. It's the part of the cell that's actually interacting with the environment. You have some idea of how these sides and this polarization relates to the cell's function. But to remind you of how we got into this epithelial cell conversation in the first place, the whole reason we needed epithelial cells was to make sheets. That's what epithelial cells do. That's why epithelial cells line everything. They make sheets. So how do we do that? Well, we do so through cell junctions, these cell-cell contacts directly between epithelial cells. Please remember that the ECM plays a relatively minor role in epithelial cell sheets. It's really interactions between the cells directly that gives epithelial sheets their durability. There are five different ways in which epithelial cells can connect to things, most uh, typically each other. They're classified according to the functions that result from these contacts. They're all called cell junctions, so they fall under that broad category, and then we'll, c we'll cover each one individually here. First, starting with tight junctions. Tight junctions are just what they sound like. They are tight seals between cells, keeping those cells together, and keeping them together so tightly that virtually nothing can leak through in between them. Schematically, a tight junction is a very close association between two different cell membranes. But experimentally, we can get a very, very small, inorganic, hydrophilic, water-soluble dye, and we can inject that dye here at the apical side of the cell. And we can watch that dye. And as that dye approaches a tight junction, it stops, and it does not diffuse path. Now again, this is a small, water-soluble dye, yet it can't pass a tight junction, because the tight junction is a tight seal. That's its purpose. The way that you form a tight junction is by using two different proteins called cloudins and occludins. These two proteins are arranged on either side of the junction, uh, both part of cell membranes, almost like two sides of a zipper on either side of a seam. And the analogy is not really an analogy, it's what happens. The claudins and the occludins zip up. The way they interact with one another is that they interlock with each other, and they zip up. And so the two cells on either side of the junction, those two cell membranes zip up. And you make a very, very tight seal between those two cells through which nothing can pass. If tight junctions didn't evolve, if they didn't exist, believe it or not, multicellular life would not be possible. You see, we live by getting our nutrition from our gut. What that means is we survive because the molecules in our digestive tract cannot seep and leak between our gut lining cells. Those molecules have no choice but to go through our gut lining cells. And when they go through our gut lining cells, those molecules are captured, further digested, metabolized, and released into the bloodstream. If those nutrient molecules could seep and leak between digestive cells, rather than going through them, we would not capture that nutrition and we would not survive. Also, it's these tight junctions that define our membrane domains. Oh, I love it! Closing loops finishing up loose ends. I love it. I told you in the membrane component of the, uh, cytos of the cell membrane lecture, this was the slide that I had on that lecture, I told you that we had these membrane domains, and membrane domains confined membrane proteins, and we had three different ways you could do it. You could adhere to the cell cortex. That made complete sense, I think. You could adhere to these molecules that lie outside the cell. That's the ECM. That made some sense, I think. Or you could have what I unsatisfyingly refer to as blocking proteins. I told you there are transmembrane proteins in the membrane of these cells that other membrane proteins cannot diffuse past. And I got a few curious looks and a few furrowed brows, and I really couldn't clarify it much more than that because I couldn't give a whole nother lecture just to clear this up. I asked you to trust me, and now you have to trust me no more. These tight junctions are those blocking proteins. The cloudins and the occludins 
are the proteins that other membrane proteins can't laterally diffuse by. And they can't laterally diffuse by them because they're so tightly zipped up into these tight junctions. And so it's these tight junctions that define membrane domains. And it's good that they do because it keeps the apical side and the basal side different, as they should be, because those two sides have very different functions. OK, so that's tight junctions. Now we have four other types of cell-cell contacts between epithelial cells we can talk about. Three of those remaining four are so similar we can discuss them together. They all exist solely for structural needs, to hold cells to things. We have adherence junctions and desmosomes. Adherence junctions and desmosomes bind one epithelial cell to another. Our third type is hemidesmosomes. Hemidesmosomes bind epithelial cells to that anchoring basal lamina that the basal portion of the cell is adhered to. All three of these junctions provide a sheet of epithelial cells with mechanical stress. Really, that's their only purpose. They're not to be sealing, and they're not for communication. It's just to hold these structures together. And they do so by joining individual cytoskeletons of individual cells together in the way that we've already loosely discussed. And this is now the third time I'm showing you this figure. This is what we mean. This is the type of junctions we're going to describe right now, holding individual intracellular cytoskeletons together so that mechanical forces and mechanical stresses can be distributed across a sheet of cells. Both adherence junctions and desmosomes connect individual cells to one another through transmembrane proteins called cadherins. That's C for calcium and adherin because the protein adheres things. So it's cadherin. Cadherins in cells that are next to one another interact tightly with one another, linking those two cells together. And this interaction requires calcium ions. That's why the cadherin, the C, is there. So it's pretty simple. It's as simple as that. You have the cadherin protein interacting with the intermediate filaments on one side or actin, different cadherins interact with different components of the cytoskeleton. But on the intracellular side, the cadherin is interacting with the cytoskeleton. And on the extracellular side, the cadherin is interacting with another cadherin. So you quite literally tie this cytoskeleton to this cytoskeleton through these cadherin-cadherin interactions. So intracellularly, as I just said, cadherins are tethered to actin filaments or to keratin. The adherin junctions, they use actin filaments. The desmosomes, they're connected to keratin. Actin, of course, is the actin component of the cytoskeleton. Keratin, hopefully you remember, is an intermediate filament. And so cadherins are anchored to, anch uh, to uh, cytoskeletal components intracellularly, and they're connected to one another extracellularly. I'm not going to really talk about hemidesmosomes so much, except to say that hemidesmosomes use integrins, and those integrins are linked to collagen. This is a similar thing. This is what we've talked about already, integrins binding to collagen. But here it's doing so to permanent, well, not permanently, but to stably anchor these epithelial cells to the basal lamina. So this is the mechanism for the interaction between the basal lamina and the epithelial cell. Now our fifth cellular interaction for contacts between epithelial cells, gap junctions. Gap junctions are the very private whispered communication system that we talked about in our cellular communication lecture. This is how cells can talk to one another if they're neighboring. Rather than being a seal like a tight junction or an anchor like a desmosome, gap junctions are actually openings. To make a gap junction, matching transmembrane proteins come together. They're called connexons. And these connexons meet and match between two neighboring cells. And when they do meet and match, they create a continuous open channel across the two cell membranes of the neighboring cells. So this is one connexon here, and this is another connexon here. And when two connexons meet and match, when they line up, you make one open thoroughfare, one continuous channel through both of those cell membranes. These cells are connected. Small inorganic and hydrophilic molecules can now freely diffuse between these cells because these cells are connected by a gap junction. That means these cells that are connected are metabolically connected 
because they can trade metabolites and molecules. They're chemically connected because they can change signals and, and enzymes. And they're even electrically coupled. Cardiac muscle cells are all connected to one another by these gap junctions. And this is what makes a wave of contraction possible across the entire heart muscle as it beats. See, the heart muscle is triggered to beat in just one place. It's innervated by neurons in only one place. And then once that contraction is started, it flows across the entire heart muscle as a wave of contraction. For those of you who are clinically inclined, you'll recognize these, these P waves and T waves. You'll know what they are coupled to the heart beating. I don't mean to step on anatomy and physiology's toes too much here, but it's pertinent to this lecture. As you trigger a heartbeat, you depolarize the cells of the atria with a neuronal signal. And that initiates a, an electrically driven contraction of the cardiac muscle, a release of calcium to allow that muscle contraction to occur. But that calcium can flow through the gap junction because calcium is small and hydrophilic. And it will flow from one cardiac muscle cell to the next. Now that next cell will contract. And then calcium will flow into the next muscle cell through the gap junction. And then that next muscle cell will contract. So you have this wave of contraction, almost like a wave at a sporting event, where it's contraction, 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 then to the ventricle cells. Contraction, 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 until the whole heart has beat. The entire heart muscle has contracted, but not all at once. It is contracted as a wave. Ba-dump. And that wave of contraction first squeezes the atria and then squeezes the ventricles. That's how we get a heartbeat. That's how we coordinate a heartbeat, not by innervating every single cardiac muscle cell. That would be insane. By initiating the contraction in one spot and having that contraction flow from that one spot as a wave all through the heart through gap junctions. Gap junctions can be regulated. So different cellular cues, either intracellular signaling molecules or extracellular signaling molecules, can cause gap junctions to be closed so that cells are not always forced to communicate with each other, but do so only when they should. This little figure from your book, I actually forget the figure number, I apologize, but this does a very good job of very loosely summarizing everything we've just talked about, both schematically on the left and then texturally on the right. We have our tight junctions, which are just sealing junctions, keep things from leaking between cells. We have our adherin junctions, these link up actin filaments spreading um, the load, the mechanical load from one cell to the whole tissue. We have desmosomes, which join intermediate filaments, keratins, from one another also to spread uh, loads. We have hemidesmosomes, which anchor cells at the basal level, at the basal membrane, to the basal lamina. This is an interaction between integrins and collagen. And then the gap junctions, which are open holes, open channels between cells, allowing small hydrophilic molecules to be traded between cells connected in this way. All right, so let's now wrap up pretty much all of this multicellular conversation by tying together some of the larger concepts that are implied in everything we've said so far, but not really overtly stated. So we are almost there. We're almost there with the concepts we're trying to get across in this lecture, as well as the concepts we're trying to... What we've got so far from all that we've covered in the last few lectures is we've got a mechanism for cell division. It's the cell cycle. We have a mechanism for specialized cells. Well, my God, I mean, we, that's pretty much what we covered for the whole first two-thirds of the course. That's gene expression, the central dogma. That's um, intracellular compartments, protein formation, protein transport. That's everything we've talked about. We have systems for cellular communication. We talked about cellular communication systems both intracellularly and extracellularly. We have systems for the regulation of cellular behaviors that falls under the communication. And now we have mechanisms for cellular adhesion and the organization and formation of multicellular structures, tissues. All we need now is one kind of tried and true system that can support it all and tie it all together. All cells in our body, regardless of their role, their cell type, the place that they exist, all of them have a set of basic and fundamental identical cellular needs. And these needs need to be met by cells of our body and cells that belong to other types. 
these are our body's support system cells. Skin provides a perfect example. We know what skin does. We know what the role of skin is. Skin is our barrier. It's our protectiveness. It's, it's what keeps us shielded from the harshness of the external environment. And skin is made up of a layer of epidermal cells and then a layer of dermis. But skin requires connective tissue to provide the mechanical and tensile strength, as well as providing a scaffolding to adhere to. So we have a dense connective tissue in skin. It's the connective tissue of the dermis. It's made up of fibroblasts, which are secreting collagen, and the collagen fibers, along with elastin, come to make a very durable extracellular matrix. So much of the dermis is ECM, with fibroblasts in there as well. This provides a place for the dermal cells, the epidermis, to adhere to, right? because that's what the ECM provides, as well as a stretchy tensile strength so that the cells don't break under the ridiculous stressful loads, mechanical loads, that our skin takes. So you can think of the fibroblast cells and the ECM that it creates as a support network for the skin cells. Well, the skin cells also require endothelial cells, in this case endothelial cells in the form of capillary cells. We need blood vessels going through the skin, bringing in nourishment to these skin cells and taking away their waste. So yeah, the skin cells are great for their protective barrier, and they now have something to adhere to and to buffer them from mechanical stress in the ECM, but that's still not enough. They need further support. They need a, a thoroughfare for nutrition coming in and waste going out. That's what the blood system does, the endothelial cells of the blood vessels. And that's not enough. The skin cells also need to receive information from the rest of the body. They need to be innervated by neurons so that information can be sent to the skin, and more importantly, information coming from the skin can be sent to the rest of the body. The skin, because it is our barrier to the outside world, is most prone to infection. So the skin cells have to be constantly patrolled by immune system macrophages. Dead cells need to be engulfed by macrophages. Uh, invading pathogens need to be engulfed by macrophages. So when you look at it this way, it really is quite ridiculous. Something as simple as skin requires so much support, so much infrastructure to do what it needs to do, be a barrier. The textbook calls this a complex supporting apparatus, and that's a quote I like. This is a highly complex supporting apparatus, a highly complex supporting infrastructure, and by that I mean the fibroblasts, the endothelial cells of the blood vessels, the nerve cells of the nervous system, uh, all of the other support cells that I just mentioned on the previous slide. That's a huge supporting apparatus that exists solely to keep the principal specialized cells, in this case the skin cells, alive. It's the only reason those other cells are there is to keep the skin cells alive. The skin cells are what matter in that region. This means that in a living system such as us, in almost every tissue you consider, there's an intricate mixture of many different cell types all working together to sustain life. So is there nothing but lung cells in the lung? Of course not. The lung cells need, need uh, connective tissue cells secreting an extracellular matrix. The lung cells need endothelial cells creating blood vessels to carry nutrients to them and wastes away. The lung cells need innervation from nerve cells. Everything we just said for skin cells is present in the lung, in the liver, in the gut, in the brain. So interestingly, life only remains possible if these cells, these cells in these tissue types, remain different while coexisting in the same place. We need the actual lung cells to keep being lung cells. But we need the endothelial cells to keep their identity. We need the macrophages to keep their identity. We need the neurons to keep their identity. Life, the way that we live it on this planet, with this physiology, is only possible if cells can coexist in the same place while keeping their independent identities, their independent responsibilities. There's a problem in all this. Most cells don't live for the entire life of the organism. Most cells die at some point before the organism dies. So now we have to make new cells to replace the dying cells, but the new cells we make have to have the individuality and the larger responsibility of the cell that died that they're replacing. That's possible with stem cells. Stem cells are capable of generating a constant continuous supply 
of differentiated cells for this purpose. Red blood cells, the skin cells that are on the surface of our epidermis, cells of the digesting lining, all of these cells die regularly and require constant replacement. Yet all of these cells are terminally differentiated, which means they are permanently in G0. They are unable to re-enter the cell cycle. They are unable to divide. This is quite the paradox, isn't it? All cells must derive from pre-existing cells. That's the cell doctrine. You can't make a cell from scratch. We need to replace a skin cell. We have to get the new skin cell from a pre-existing cell, yet the pre-existing skin cells that are there can't divide. What do we do? Well, we use stem cells. Stem cells are also called proliferating precursor cells. And to translate that term, what we mean is that stem cells are dividing cells, proliferating, dividing cells that can become something else. They are the precursors for another cell type. Well, that sounds good. That's what we need. We need to make new cells. We need cells that can divide. But we need those new cells that we make to become something else, and, and that's good. That's what these precursor cells do. That's what stem cells do. Stem cells are non-differentiated cells that can divide continuously. As long as the organism they inhabit are alive, stem cells can continue dividing. When a stem cell does divide, the two daughter cells that result have choices. They can either be a stem cell, just like the mother cell was. And this, of course, is important. We, we need stem cells. Stem cells are our only source of dividing cells. So we need some stem cells to be still stem cells. But the other choice is to terminally differentiate and become what the dead cell that they're replacing was. And this is needed too. This is why the stem cells are maintained, because we need these cells to divide and differentiate. So when a stem cell divides, typically, you get two daughter cells, of course. One of them remains a stem cell. So it basically replaces the mother cell that was lost in the division. The other cell, the new cell that arose from the, dif from the division, differentiates into whatever cell needed to be replaced. So what that means is that stem cells themselves don't really do anything. They don't really have a function. Their function, if you want to think of it that way, is to be dividing, to be dividing cells. That's what they do. Stem cells divide. One stem cell becomes two. One of those two new cells becomes a cell that does something, becomes the liver cell that needed replacing, becomes the lung cell that needed replacing. Stem cells are usually only present in very, very small numbers. They're actually quite hard to find, quite hard to identify. They're limited in the number of types of cells they can differentiate into. So in other words, there are stem cells that are unique and specific to the digestive system. Those stem cells can only become digestive system cells. They're, they're not what we call totipotent. They can't be any cell type. They are pluripotent. They can become certain cell types. What's important here, though, is that these stem cells of the digestive system can become any digestive system cell can become a cell that makes mucus, can become a cell that, um, that um, absorbs nutrition, can become a cell that secretes ECM. So these stem cells can replace any cell that's part of the digestive system. And that's a big deal. That's what we needed. All of those cells, nutrient-absorbing cells, mucus-making cells, cells that secrete collagen for the ECM, those cells are all terminally differentiated. They ain't dividing anymore. So when we need to replace them, we need these digestive system stem cells to step in and become those new cells we need to replace. That is the job of stem cells, to divide. That is the sole responsibility and need that we have for stem cells. In fact, if all of the stem cells stopped dividing, we would have a big, big problem. The life expectancy of that organism would be numbered. If all stem cells lost the ability to divide, there would be no replacement, rejuvenation, or replenishment of dying cells. And so the life of the organism would be confined and constrained to the life of the last cell, quite literally. But with stem cells, we can extend that because dying cells can be replaced individually. But there's another side to this coin. Too much cell division is also a bad thing. That is cancer. Too much cell division will also lead to disease. So we have uh, the risk of the end of life if there's no cell division, and the risk of end of life is there if there's too much cell division. And so there's a very fine balance there in between.
And that last scenario, uncontrolled cell division, uncontrollable cell growth, is what we will talk about in our next lecture. And that next lecture is our last lecture of the semester. But what did we talk about today? We started off describing the ECM. The extracellular matrix exists to support cells. It binds cells together, especially in connective tissue. There are different ECMs for different purposes. Bones and tendons tend to have hard, static, durable ECMs that can withstand tensile stress. Muscles and skin have looser ECMs that are more good for stretching stress. The proteins in these ECMs is more scanty. In either case, the main structural component, the main load-bearing component, the main stress-resistant component of the ECM is a fibrous protein called collagen. All connective tissues have collagen, but the collagen is specialized for whatever that connective tissue is, and so there are specialized collagen-secreting cells for those tissue types. We talked about fibroblasts most. Fibroblasts crawl on collagen that they secreted. They pull on it, stretch it, compact it, and organize it, creating either the wicker basket, the cable bundle, uh, or the interlocked bricks, the alternating direction um, bricks sheets that that collagen should be for that specific type of ECM. Now cells can crawl on this ECM. They can crawl on this collagen through integrins. Actin is bound to integrins intracellularly. On the exterior side, the integrins are bound to fibronectin, and the fibronectin is directly connected to collagen. This allows cells to crawl on a collagen matrix. We then talked about the compression-resistant ECM, which withstands pressure stress. These are the proteoglycans and the GAGs. We moved on to epithelial sheets, so now we're not relying on ECMs to hold cells together, we're relying on cells to hold cells together. In epithelial cells, we have uh, sheets of cells that are adhered to one another on both sides, neighboring cells held together. And epithelial sheets, and indeed epithelial cells, have two sides. They're polarized. They have an apical surface, which faces outward, away from the tissue, and the basal surface, which is anchored to the tissue. Epithelial cells are the only cell type that line our body cavity. They line the inside and the outside of our bodies, and they do this because of their ability to join together into sheets. We talked about the five different ways that these cells can join together. Tight junctions, adherence junctions, and gap junctions, as well as desmosomes and hemidesmosomes. Tight junctions are these tight, impermeable seals between cells. The adherence junctions and the desmosomes hold cells together through their cytoskeletons, distur um, distributing forces, mechanical forces on those cells. Hemidesmosomes are interactions between integrins and collagens at the basal membrane, anchoring these epithelial cells to the basal uh, ECM. And then gap junctions were these open holes between cells by which they could communicate and trade molecules. We then moved on to the bigger picture. Uh, every single tissue type really, by definition, has to be a complex supporting apparatus made up of many, many different cell types, all working together to keep the principal cells of that tissue alive, to keep the lung cells alive in the lung, to keep the liver cells alive in the liver. And then we also need, for when those cells die, a means to replace and replenish them, and that's where stem cells come in. Stem cells are dividing cells that really don't have their own function, but they can differentiate into other cell types which do have function. So it is the sole job of the stem cells to divide. That's why they exist. They exist to be dividing cells so that the new cells that spring from them can replace dead or dying cells in these individual tissues. That is how living systems work. And we will end the semester talking about what happens when these living systems don't behave appropriately and these systems begin to break down.